Just Baseball Show, Jack McMullen, Scoopsy McGee on Monday, <laughs> July 11th, 2022. Why did I just call you Scoopsy McGee, man? I got to break something. <laughs> like a little you, kid. You capital J <laughs> journalist. Yeah, so... I told you, I don't want to be a news guy. I don't want to break shit, but I like to break positive shit. And I got the opportunity to uh, a little bit ahead of the announcement of the all-star lineup. So I was notified that Nestor Cortez was making the all-star team, which is awesome because I was a little worried over the last couple of starts, just naturally. He couldn't yeah. pitch sub two ERA all year. He had a couple bad starts over the last couple of days. And I was worried. I'm like, oh, I hope he still gets in. Found out he got in, got to tweet it out. Uh, Yankees fans went nuts. So it was probably one of my you know biggest tweets ever. Uh, probably one of my biggest tweets since the Dinger incident, which is another reason why I'd rather just yeah. break positive stuff. It's, uh, it's so like it's pretty, Tosh damn, oh. pretty damn cool. It's like Tosh.0. Oh. Are you ready to give it another shot? This yeah, yeah. Web, web redemption. redemption. It was, this was my web redemption and it was uh, it was great. It was great. Um, you know, honestly though, dude, we, you know, we I'm not going to pretend that we talk to Nestor Cortez every day, but this is a guy that, you know, we were fortunate enough to interview ahead of this year. Yeah. You know, we knew that he was an awesome story just as a guy that made himself a legitimate big leaguer, period. That was was the cool cool. part. He was cool because what he went through to become a fine pitcher for the Yankees was awesome. Awesome. Now he's all-star Nestor Cortez. Correct. He could have been a 3-8. He could have been a 4-2 ERA guy that hung around in the big leagues for 10 years, and his story is magnificent. It's worth it. He's an all-star. I was honored to be able to uh, tweet that out, and uh, it's got to be so cool for him. I can't imagine. I mean, you know, I I can't imagine. It just seems like the story keeps getting better for him. And, you know, I hope he, you know, gets – hot again and gets going right in the right direction. But I mean, this guy's an all-star after being a 36th round pick and a rule five draft pick that was returned. He was yeah. returned yeah. In, after being selected in the rule five draft. So awesome story. And congratulations to Nestor Cortez. The only other guy that I've heard of that was returned uh, from the rule five draft was Connor Joe. I think Nestor Cortez <laughs> and Connor Joe are the only two that and I've heard of mistakes. There, Both mistakes. I mean, it's ridiculous, dude. But yeah, that was cool to see Nestor get that nod. And, and he's so deserving because yes. what he's doing is just utterly incredible. Um, and yes, you could make the argument that a guy like Dylan Cease should be in. And, and Cease has way more punch outs. I understand. Yada, yada, yada. Great. What Nestor Cortez did for the best team in baseball through the Correct. first three months of the season is just utterly awesome. And, and he should be commended for it with the all-star nod. A hundred percent. And and I know that this is not the thing that like goes into all-star voting, but he's a fly ball pitcher that pitches in Yankee stadium. Uh, and, and I think that in itself is impressive that he's been able to, you know, find ways to get outs, find ways to not get burned. And yes, of course, I, you can make a strong case for Cease. You can make a strong case for a lot of different guys. And we talked about it before we press record, right, man? They're like, we didn't really want to dive into the all-star stuff because of course there's always going to be snubs. There's always going to be snubs. There's always going to be guys that, you know, you feel like probably should have got in. And I hate harping on that because it's, it's one of those things where if, if you're talking about someone who didn't get in, who you felt like should have got in, you're implying that someone that is in shouldn't be there. Show me who you think shouldn't be there. And that's where I think it just turns into a joke. They're all deserving. Everyone is deserving to be there. Maybe some guys a little bit more than others. Uh, but, you know, it's always going to be one of those situations where if you guys get left off, I'm glad it wasn't Nestor. I feel bad for Dylan Cease. He will make plenty of all-star games. Yeah. He'll make plenty of all-star games. But Nestor Cortez, it just seems like the perfect story. And um, I don't even know if he's going to throw in this game because he's been throwing so much lately. Uh, but even just having that all-star jersey on, seeing that guy there with with the mustache is going to be pretty damn cool. Well, and he's going to throw Thursday, yeah? I think so. So if he throws Thursday, the all-star game's on Tuesday? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I saw a bunch of Yankees fans quote tweeting and going, I hope he rests. Just because I, I think that's been a common topic uh, amongst Yankees fans is like, this dude has never really thrown that many innings. Nestor's combated that and said, I've thrown minor league seasons and then gone to the, you know, to the Dominican winter league and, or summer league, which one? No, Dominican winter league, winter league, winter league and, and thrown another 50, 60 innings. So if you compile it all, I've thrown 180, whatever it is, but you know, there seems to be some concern around whether he's going to be able to do that for a whole season. I think it's dumb. 
to con- be concerned about something that you don't even know is a thing. Uh, but, you know, I can understand the wanting to tread a little bit lightly for a guy that has not pitched 200 innings really ever. Um, and, and I even saw that today with the Marlins with Sandy. I was yeah. just at the game as we're recording this on a Sunday. Marlins pulled him with 93 pitches in a huge spot. And I yeah. think they're starting to just like, let's be a little bit careful here. I know Sandy could have went two more innings, probably could have went three more, but you, you got to manage these guys a little bit. And, and especially at this part of the season. I saw Mish's tweet. I, I saw that it was relatively planned for him to only go like 90 ish pitches, go less than a hundred pitches. Do you think that's because he's been going 110, 115 each of his last, you know, five, six, seven starts and, they just need to break up the monotony of constantly running your arm into the ground. A hundred percent. Cause like he's going to do it right. Like he, he's willing and able and, and just because he's willing and able doesn't mean you should. Right. And, yeah. and he's shown no signs of, of fatigue. He's shown zero signs of his velo dipping even late in starts. But I, I literally had a moment where I'm sitting at the game today and I'm watching him throw and I'm like, wait, th- this guy's still a human. Like, no. God forbid a baseball comes back and hits him, he's going to bleed. Like, he's a human. He's not an alien, right? Like, right. You, you can't just throw him 130 pitches every day because it seems like he's capable of doing it. Like, he yeah. is a human. And I, I know people are like, oh, the Marlins are trying to win now. And I saw a lot of fans like, they need to win this game. They need to survive. If Sandy Alcantara fades at the end of the year, they're doomed, even if they're in a playoff spot. They're doomed. Uh, so they cut him a little bit short, but the Marlins bullpen held up and it was a pretty fun game to be at. But, you know, I, I think you have to keep this guy at least somewhat in check. And 93 pitches for him is probably 75 pitches for a normal person. Yes. So he probably feels very well rested today. I was um, <laughs> it was funny. I was watching the video of him going around the clubhouse after he was tabbed as an all star, like dapping everybody up and giving them hugs and everything. And I was taken aback for a moment because his hand was not going through people. I thought he was, yeah, this, just, yeah, just this e- ethereal life form that, you know, was half ghost, half alien, like you're saying, but no, it turns out he can actually dap people up like a normal human being like us mere mortals. Yes. And that's the thing that I'm glad they're, they're acknowledging that he is a mortal. One other thing I want to note on Sandy, I got to the game yesterday or two days ago, really early uh, for Keith Hernandez's Jersey retirement, which the Mets, pulled out all the stops. That was they very always cool. nail it with that. Oh man. It was awesome. You know, Piazza spoke, they had, they had everybody there and it was a really cool event. Mets fans showed out really strong. It was really cool. Uh, but right before the event even started. So I mean, hours before the game, and this was the day before Sandy was going to start, right? Sandy's out there doing sprints. Nobody's on the field except for people setting up the, you know, the whole on field situation. Um, and Sandy Alcantara is running sprints in the outfield. And uh, the day before his start in the sun, it was hot as shit. Uh, it, like, it's just – and you know what he's doing right now? I can promise you he's working out as we're recording this right now. And then as you're listening to this tomorrow, he's working out. He works out the next day for two and a half hours. And Don Mattingly says he begs him not to, but you can't tell him to stop because it works. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, it's, it's amazing kind of seeing behind the scenes a little bit how hard this guy works. Do you think he ever sits there and just acknowledges that like he's super handsome and really good at baseball? Do you think he ever just takes a moment and looks at himself in the mirror? Like, damn, you know what? I did enough today. He should, but I don't think so, man. (laughs) Like I I told you the the one time I covered the game and and he went, he went, I think it was nine innings and I asked him, you know, how do you feel being able to go 110? He's like, I want to go 130. Like I, that always sits with me. I don't even get sick talking about that. Cause I'm like, what a freak. They, th- that's just job. like unwell. Like I'd be like, yeah, I went one ten. I'm gassed. Like, but you know, I, I felt good today. For him, it's like wasn't enough. I and, went forty and- in two thirds of an inning. I'm gassed. I'm gassed. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a freak, and I, I I hope he can keep it up. You know, it's been really cool to watch. And what's amazing is he continues to do it without massive strikeout numbers. And he had five punchies today, and one of them was on Jeff McNeil trying to bunt for a hit with two strikes. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was really four. I'll give that four and a half punchies. Really. Yeah. Um, speaking of freaks, Julio Rodriguez, and, and we can talk about how the wild card standings look going into the final week before the All Star break. But Seattle's nine and one. They in their last ten, they've won eight in a row. They've won eleven and twelve. Toronto has lost four in a row. They're one and nine in their They're last in ten games. They're in. 
deep doo doo. But deep. what Julio Rodriguez has done for Seattle, what Carlos Santana just did for the man. <laughs> yeah, weekend, what the hell is that? I mean, what Eugenio Suarez has been doing for Seattle in July is amazing. And, and this team actually looks like they could be that postseason team after two weeks ago. Literally two weeks ago, we were saying no shot, sell it off, trim the fat. Let's get going with a young core next year. Dude, it is amazing to see. And I, I, I really think you got to give it all to, to Julio Rodriguez right now, right? I mean, how can you – I know other guys have stepped up. We'll, we'll talk about Carlos Santana and things like that. But really, where is this team without Julio Rodriguez? They're nowhere. They're dead in the water, right? I mean, they're fully dead in the water. And, and it, it, it's one of those things where he's young and you want to, like, temper your expectations and, and be reasonable – Cause I think it's really easy for, you know, our job is to react to things, right? Like you, Peter and I, our job is to speak about things that happen right after they happen. So naturally we're going to be a little reactionary. And I always try to keep that in check and be like, you know, when something crazy happens, I want to react to this, but let's also take a step back and, and realize in the grand scheme of things, how much does this mean? And can they do this for a longer period of time? There's so many checks and balances that you kind of need to go through in your mind. Julio yeah. Rodriguez kind of throws that out the window because yes. now I'm starting to see what he's doing. And also he's, he's making it more believable, right? Like he's making a larger sample size, a larger display. Uh, and, and I think it's getting to the point now where you just cannot deny that this guy is not only a superstar, but could be one of the best players in the game moving forward. I mean, like that, that is what he's doing. Maybe he'll go through some rules. Maybe he'll go through some slumps, but I just find it so hard to imagine a player with his characteristics, which is, you know, elite speed, elite power, now great defense, and bats a ball that can, you know, it's always been great. The bats a ball has always been great in the minor leagues, had a little bit of a learning curve at the big leagues. He's going to be an above average hit tool guy uh, at the big league level. That's going to continue to get better, but he's able to produce despite, you know, whatever inconsistencies he has at the plate because of his, you know, ability to slug on contact. I mean, is it crazy to call this guy a, a big league superstar already? I don't think so. Let me run you through the qualified rookie rankings because here's what Julio Rodriguez leads rookies in in Major League Baseball this year. <gasps> Home runs, <laughs> RBIs, hits, doubles, extra base hits, total bases, runs scored, stolen bases. Everything except batting average. Yeah. It's utterly amazing what he's doing. And yeah, the OPS is at 811. Look at that however you want. J-Rod's an all-star, and it's not because of just what he does in terms of putting fans in seats. He's an all-star because he's one of the best players in baseball. He's one of the best 100%. outfielders in the American League. And he's turned into, with Jeremy Pena, not necessarily even sputtering, just Jeremy Pena missing. No, just, just being a human. Hurt. Yeah, just being mortal. <laughs> Julio Rodriguez has become the unanimous American League Rookie of the Year at this point. And it's going to take a legitimate injury to pry this award away from Julio Rodriguez because of what he's done for the Mariners and what he's done in terms of individual accolades in the front half of this season. And the, the other crazy thing, dude, is, is you talk about his rookie rankings and all of those, all of those points where he's basically leading the rookies and everything. If you draw back to what the last 26, 27 games or the last two months, whatever you want to pick from, he's been one of the best players in baseball. Yes. Right, like th this has been a guy that's been one of the best players in baseball, period. Over his last 26 games, 290, 346, 600 with seven home runs and four stolen bases. I, this is a dude that's just, just kind of figured it out already. Uh, and and I, I would like to see how teams try to game plan for him, how teams try to, uh, you know, get him out, because I think he's kind of figured out, you know, how to hit at the big league level. And I'm sure there'll be some goals here and there, but He's too talented to not remain productive almost at all times. But I also do want to give a shout out to Carlos Santana because what, what has he done now? Three home runs in, in four days, something like that. Oh, he multiple home it. run, multiple home runs in the last 24 hours. It, th this guy, I think, needed a little bit of a rejuvenation. I think we kind of we underrate how tough it is to play on a team that just isn't good <laughs> and, yeah. and just has no direction. And I would argue that the Royals have not really had much direction. And he was there for 2021 and then this season as well. Santana is a guy that has been productive, you know, year after year after year up until what, 2020. 
Yeah. And look, I don't think he's going to be back to the form of a guy that hit 30 home runs and, you know, got on base in a near 400 clip. But what he's doing right now, which is 250, 372, 361 slash line, that'll play. And I think he can keep that up. And the Mariners, it's not like they gave up much. I think they gave up this pitcher named Will Fleming from Lake Forest. You remember him? And, and, and one other prospect. It was two flyer lottery ticket prospects. They were two minor league pitch, like two minor league pitchers. Mm-hmm. I, I think relievers. I think they're both relievers right now. Um, Great low cost move. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And yeah, you can get Ty France off his feet for a couple of days or you can just have Carlos Santana DH. He's just another bat that works well. And he's another guy with a good eye that is going to put together quality at bats. That's something that's never really going to age. And Carlos Santana has always put together quality at bats. He's one of those guys that, you know, has put together seasons in recent years where he has walked more than he has struck out. That will never slump. Yeah, will he strike out a little bit more? Yes, but is it ever going to be overly dramatic? No, it's not. If something's going to go, it's the sheer accumulation of hits or of home runs or of RBIs. It's not going to be approach at the plate. No, that's a bench bat right there. And when a a great lefty bench bat, it's a great lefty bench bat. And when he catches fire in a series that you so badly need to win and win convincingly against a team that is right next to you in the wild card standings, and he's stepping up, leave him in. That was the hot hand. You just kept on feeding the hot hand and they did so. I I love that. I think that's exactly what what my thoughts are. And I got to ask you now. Because they call up Matt Brash, who we know how talented Matt Brash is. Yeah. Less pressure now, bullpen roll, can spin the shit out of that slider now 15 times in an inning and call it quits and walk away with a shutout inning the way the Marlins have really had Tanner Scott do, their closer. All he does is throw throw sliders and the occasional fastball. Like yeah. he could be that could be a legit just internal addition of a high leverage bullpen arm for you immediately. You hope that the Mariners get Mitch Hanniger back. Yeah. As we are recording this, they are tied for the final playoff spot in the American League. They're going to have to fend off some really good teams that could get hot down the stretch. But I ask you now at 44 and 42, are the Seattle Mariners a playoff team? I'm going to go to the bathroom and I'll tell you. Okay. I'm kidding. Uh, it's, it's hard, man. It's really hard because I think Toronto is the only team standing in their way because After that, you've got Baltimore and Cleveland and the White Sox. I think the White Sox are so far gone mentally and emotionally that they're not going to contend for a playoff spot this year. I don't think Baltimore has the talent to sustain what they just did through the front half of the year. Now it falls on Toronto and Cleveland. If Cleveland doesn't buy, then they're out. Mm -hmm. I think they they can't win as is. No, they need to make additions to the roster and they're not going to fluke their way into a postseason, albeit an expanded postseason, because you've got this surging Mariners team that is obviously super talented. What they're doing right now is what everybody expected from them in the preseason. Correct. What everybody expected from the Blue Jays in the preseason, they have yet to do, and they're playing their worst baseball at this very moment, yet they are still tied for that last wild card spot with the Mariners. So... It, it, I literally just took a yes or no question and gave you about 45 seconds there. So circling back, no, because I think Toronto will normalize a little bit more. Okay. I'm going to make my case real quick and then we'll move on to the next topic. But yeah, I want to make my, my Seattle Mariners case because look, I, I, I obviously hear you and I hear where you're coming from. And, and honestly, I, I think it's a coin flip. There's a lot of things that can go wrong for them, and especially yeah. now on the pitching side. I think there's some things that, you know, we have to see how it shakes out. We just saw George Kirby get sent to AAA. I think it's more to work on some things in a controlled environment, and he'll be right back. It's not like he was a disaster. I assume Kirby's going to be back. But I look at the Seattle Mariners team, and I think they're starting to come together, man. Like, I, I just think it's finally starting to happen for them. And when you look at them top to bottom now, it's exactly what we thought they were going to be, minus Jared Koenig. Obviously, it's, it's a shame that Jared Koenig's not contributing right now. We are hoping Kyle Lewis would be in the fold. Those two things haven't quite happened, but nobody imagined Julio Rodriguez 
being a legitimate bona fide superstar. So adding a legit all-star to your lineup here, Ty France now back in the lineup, Mitch Haniger, you're hoping will come back and be healthy. Eugenio Suarez has been a legitimate big league contender or big league piece for them, which is crazy. He had the big walk off the other day. He's got a 128 WRC plus Jesse Winker can't be worse. And all of a sudden he has a WRC plus above hundred and looks to at least be some sort of an option as a platoon bat. I love the offensive depth here. I love what they are doing lineup wise. And I think they're super balanced and I think they can go out and get another bat if they want to, but I think they've got some guys back that I think will help them. Then on the pitching side, Gilbert, Robbie Ray is starting to finally look more like Robbie Ray. As I can't of late. deny what Robbie Ray is doing anymore. You can't, the bullpen's still really solid. They have a bunch of arms in the minor leagues. All of them could help in different ways. We talk about Brash and then Kirby will be back and will help. Yeah, I think this team just has so many irons in the fire that they can find a way and they have the prospect capital to almost go out and get whatever player they want. Jerry DePoto might be getting inspired here because the Mariners are getting hot at the right time. I would have said they're not buyers three weeks ago, but now I look at this team and I say they're winning. They're starting to put it together. They're currently in a spot for the playoffs. How can Jerry DePoto not buy after shelling out more than a hundred million dollars in free agents this past off season. I think they go out and make a trade and I think they get healthy and they continue to get better at the right time. And maybe they'll get a bonus from Kelnick or, or a uh, Kyle Lewis at some point down the stretch. So rebuttal to your rebuttal, who do you have more faith in buying successfully and buying effectively Jerry DePoto or Ross Atkins? I'd say DePoto. Ooh, you sure? I'd say Depoto, man. Like they just have so much capital. Like, well, we know what how if the Blue Jays showed us that they can do on the trade market, other than go get Jose Barrios. And I mean, look where that's gone. Uh, yeah. What else have they done recently? That's a good question. Like w- they have done a phenomenal job of identification and development. And, yeah. and that is something like no doubt about it. I mean, they are so talented. Top to bottom, homegrown players. They did go out and sign, you know, George Springer. They added free agents here and there. But when I'm when we're talking about like legitimately making a big splash, they haven't really made that many big splashes in the trade market. But I guess where's the big splash to make right now in the trade market? Is it Luis, Luis Castillo? Castillo? But but the thing is, is they don't have that much prospect capital. They don't want to part with a Ricky Tiedemann. and they don't want to part with a Relvis, who was apparently untouchable last year. I don't know if that changes this year. Really? That was the that was the reports out of Toronto. So it, I look at the the Mariners and I just think it's so much easier. It's so much easier to trade from their prospect crop, I think, than to trade from the Jays who they can't really miss here. They already gave up, and I, and I never liked Austin Martin, but they gave up their capital in Austin Martin and Simeon Woods Richardson. Yeah, Tiedem and I assume is untouchable, or Relvis Groshans is a depreciating prospect to a degree if people if blue jays fans continue to tell me that that kevin vigio can lead a package in a deal i'm gonna freak out and i I just i look at the mariners and i think that they can put a a more enticing package together that'll kind of make things easier and depoto has been a little bit more uh, i think of a uh, risk taker And, and i think the mariners need to take a risk i guess my question is we go around the horn here catcher you've got kirk and gabby moreno versus whoever the the Mariners are running out of catcher right now. I know Cal Raleigh's been playing a lot at the moment. Cal Raleigh's been all right. He's been all right, but obviously I'm taking Kirk and Moreno. Yes. At first, it's kind of a toss-up between Vladdy and Ty France. Should we just call it a tie at this moment? Yeah, even though obviously Vladdy's the the higher ceiling player, but in terms of what you're getting production-wise, yeah, call it a toss-up. Okay, second base is Espinal versus who? Dylan Moore? Adam Frazier slash Dylan Frazier. Moore. Yeah, I mean, I'm taking Espinal. Yeah. At short, it's J.P. Crawford versus Bo Bichette. Who are we going with? It's closer than a lot of people would like to think it is. I Obviously, going Bichette, it's sexier. But, I, again, cohesive winning team. Crawford can, can help you more, I think, in a lot of ways. At this point, on July 11th, 2022, do you go with Eugenio Suarez or Matt Chapman at third? Oh, that is, that is a tough question. Chapman's heating up. I, I consider them a wash. You think so? I think they're kind of a wash. I think they're kind of a wash too. And then the outfield, obviously, 
Toronto has Guriel Springer, who else? Teoscar Hernandez, right? I mean, who's been dreadful for most of the year. Who's been brutal for most of the year versus Seattle? Who did they just run out this go around? They just ran out Julio. They just ran out uh, Sam Haggerty, and they ran out Justin Upton. Justin Upton is getting some some play time out there. Man, and Tapia. I forgot about my guy, Rymel Tapia. Somebody just tweeted at me yesterday and said, uh, Rymel, Rymel Tapia already has four pumps this year. I said the, the haters are absolutely cooked. They're cooked. <laughs> Tapia, <laughs> Tapia figured it out. He's Done. back. The dude's no, hitting 263. He's a superstar. <laughs> I still think Kyle Lewis, if healthy, which is a big if, can be a big contributor in his 14 games in triple, 1,100 OPS. When he was playing in his four games, he homered twice. Like if he's healthy, that's a huge help. Kalanick, you hope can help in some way. And then again, you've got Hanniger kind of waiting in the pipeline. That outfield could get better than than the Jays situation pretty quickly, or at least right there with it. And then I think pitching wise, you got to go with the Mariners. Well, you have to go with the Mariners at this point, especially with the bullpen, especially what Andres Munoz has looked like over his last couple of outings. Munoz yep. looks electric again, and he yeah. hit some blips in the radar in the middle of the year. It's fine. But now he's been absolutely phenomenal. And then what Paul Seawald looks awesome. What about Penn Murphy? I just love yeah, the way he spells Murphy. M-U-R-F-E-E, Penn Murphy. I, that's, like, that's like when you're five years old and don't know how to spell your own last name, potentially. Yeah. But no, Penn Murphy's been great. Eric, Eric Swanson, nasty. Yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting group. And again, Brash can really put them over the top. I, look, of course, the Jays are the are – the, safe and reasonable answer. Yeah. Baseball is never safe and reasonable. And I think you can make enough of a case for the Mariners to, to put it together and get hot at the right time. I understand. Um, what else we got to hit on this Monday? Adam Wayno, who should Adam pitch Wayne 45. Yeah. Adam Wainwright should be Tom Brady. <laughs> like, yeah. Minus the rings and all the things that are out of your control in baseball. But, but the reason I say Brady is that like he ages like fine wine and as his, maybe physical skills slightly depreciate his acumen for the game basically makes, makes up for it. Right. Like that's where Brady is making audibles at the line. Um, you know, is reading defenses. He's done, he did it for decades, but got better and better at it at the later stages of his career and continues to get better at it. And that's why he just continued to age. Well, Adam Wainwright almost knows how to pick apart a hitter better than any pitcher I can think of in a long time. And while his stuff, you know, may not be what it was when he was, you know, one of the best pitchers in the game in some stretches and, and you know, consistent just top 20 arm, I think, at his peak, he has just mastered the art of pitching. And it's amazing to watch. 40 years old, he has said this is his last year. And it makes me sad because it's very evident that I think he could do this Jamie Moyer style for another three plus years. He is arguably better in some ways than he was last year. He's at least on par. And it's just like when you're not even slowing down a tick from what was that, whoa, what the hell is this guy doing last year? It's amazing to see what he's doing this year. He's a big reason why the Cardinals are even afloat right now. So obviously you have his curveball. He throws his sinker 30% of the time, 89 miles an hour. What do you think opponents are hitting against his sinker? Not looking at it. Um, it's got to be like low 200s. They're hitting 233. Okay. What do you think the average launch angle against his sinker is? <laughs> like, like three. It's like 14 degrees. <laughs> just That's a great. ground ball machine. Yeah. Yeah. I, like it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And like, we know what the curveball does, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to be successful with just a slow curveball. Wayno has figured out how to throw it just enough or, or like where you're not totally leaving yourself exposed. The cutter has given him kind of this, this just aging like fine wine kind of thing as well, where he's able to mix that pitch in a bit more. Um, that's been good to get on in on the hands of guys. And dude, he's front dooring these sinkers yeah. on guys. Yeah. Like you're, you're seeing guys take it inside lefties, and it comes back in on the inside part of the plate. He's an uncomfortable at bat. And I want, I want you to pull up. Do you have a savant page up? No, I've got his pitcher list up. Let me get his do, do they have the, the heat maps? No, for, pull up savant. So I, and if anybody is listening right now, that is like, you know, not 
driving or doing something that, you, you know, you can't pull your phone out and look, look at Adam Wainwrights because he doesn't throw the four schemer that much. It's around 10% of the time, but look at the heat map of his four seamer. Usually it's a big blob for him. It, you can see the separate red spots, meaning that his four seamer serves a purpose. He's only throwing it in certain spots to either set up another pitch or to, you know, catch you off guard after setting it up with other pitches and you can see the four spots that he puts it in. It's bottom right, bottom left, top left, and top right. It, it, there's nothing in the middle. That is that is surgical. It's incredible. And his curveball is bottom right. That's yeah. entirely where it is. It's Look at just the cutter. bottom right. Look at the cutter. The cutter. Made. It's just bottom right. It's right on the black. He doesn't make mistakes. Here's yeah. Here's why I like the Brady comp that you just threw out. Brady does not have the most talent in football. It's nowhere close. You could argue that in terms of just sheer arm talent and athleticism, Brady might be dead last in the NFL. Fields yeah. has more arm talent and overall at, athleticism oh, than by, Tom Brady. By so much, it's not even close. But the game works slower for Tom Brady than everybody else. And here's the thing about pitching, too. You don't need to throw 95 with this, with this 3,000 RPM hook if the game works slower for you and the game works slower for Adam Wainwright, cause he's just been around forever. So he's seen everything already and he knows exactly how to feel his fingers off of a cutter. If he works on that in a bullpen, he knows how to grab that exact same feeling and get to it two days later on a mound. A hundred percent. And, and I know Yachty's out, but I think Yachty's influence is still felt. Yes. You know, and, and a lot of those things that you're talking about, I think is through conversations with Yachty and Yachty was healthy for the early parts of the season. Yeah. They were bad in their battery mates, but I can promise you whoever's behind the dish. You don't think they're sitting down with Wayno with Yachty and, and having a round table conversation. I'd bet my life on it. And having somebody like that, you know, Yachty being there for, for his entire career, right. We're talking about like a guy that has, I, I don't know what the situation is to make another football comp, Philip Rivers to Antonio Gates combination for touchdowns yeah. was like for their entire career together. Yeah. I would love to see a stat of like how many pitches thrown to the same catcher. I, I mean, I, I would take Wayne Wright and Yachty over, I think any other battery may don't do they already, them. don't they already lead in games? Do they? That's, that's the thing. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I think they lead that in is, games or like they're second in games. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my point. Like that's an advantage that you can't fabric. Like you can't, recreate unless you have 20 years <laughs> and and i know that's got to be a huge part of this as well um yeah. because yachty you know and you know that guy knows the game like like he, he's basically you has Haslam for them <laughs> like he, he he's not good <laughs> i know he plays more but like he's really not good i watched him even against you know high a guys on the backfields and he looked just just so slow and brutal and it's tough to watch at times it's pool holes-esque yeah. but there's so much value that yachty brings and uh, I mean, you, you can you can justify it. God, he's going to be a great manager if he decides to go that route. I hope he does. I, I hope he does. does. Because there's going to be a long list of, of teams that would love to have him as a manager. But, like, do you clear out Ali Marmol and just hire Yadier Molina? That's pretty, it's pretty screwed up. I yeah, don't know. But, yeah, but come on. <laughs> what do you do? Let's be ruthless here. Uh, yeah, I mean. I think you you have to let Yachty get some experience, right? Bring him on as a bench coach or whatever, see yeah. how it goes. An advisor. An advisor. Let him sit in the booth for a couple of years and then just like bring him down when he gets the itch. He wants to be in the dugout again. I, I like know. that. Let's we'll see. It. Last thing on my agenda um, slash your agenda is previewing Pirates Marlins <laughs> or, pre or previewing Mets Braves. Either one. Um, Which one do you want to go with? I mean, look here, it's, it's a legitimate chance for the Marlins to prove that they're buyers and yeah. <laughs> no, but honestly, they have a nice stretch coming up. They got four games against the pirates and then the Phillies and then three games against the reds. So, I mean, like the Marlins can, can try to convince front office and ownership that they're buyers. I don't need, they don't need to do much. Just go get Ramon Laureano, but the serious series. And, and I think like a really interesting one because we've talked about it a few times on here now, right? Yeah. Mets or Braves. You know, who's going to pull this thing out at the end of the day? I talked about, you know, it's, talked about this with Ryan Finkelstein. Yeah. I don't know if it necessarily matters too much who wins the division. I, Cause I think either one of those teams is going to be a nightmare to face in a three game set with the pitching right. situation they have and the offense. 
but I mean, of course you always want to get that division. Yeah. I, I think this is a really interesting opportunity. This series coming up when national TV, a lot of exciting things going on here. Braves are red hot. Mets still are still playing good ball. It's a good chance before the all-star break to slap your, you know what on the table and say, Hey, get ready for the second half buddies. We're coming for you. If you're the Atlanta Braves and I can promise the Atlanta Braves have had this series circled for a minute. I I, I guarantee they are coming out guns a blazing. And I know the Mets, they want to beat them in their own ballpark too. I mean, the the Braves are the defending champs. Let's, I mean, the Mets should be the one circling this on their calendar, even though the Mets are the first place team, they got more to prove. Well, and it starts tonight with Scherzer and Freed. Uh, that, that is the tone setter of all tone setters for a three game set. You got Scherzer and Freed, then you have Peterson and Strider tomorrow. And then on Wednesday to wrap it up, you've got Bassett and Chuck Morton. So, I mean, that, that lines up really well. The only thing that the Mets would hope for is if Jacob deGrom was in the rotation. And I don't even know if Atlanta could draw this up any better right now with obviously you want Freed and Strider in there. Do you want, I don't know, Kyle Wright as opposed to Charlie Morton, but I think you, you roll with Morton in game three of this series. I think Freed and Scherzer as the tone setter is as must watch of TV as we have on tonight, unless you are inclined to watch Lance Lynn and Cal Quantrill. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I don't know if you saw Cal Quantrill's last outing. Um, I, I, I feel safe on the tattoo bet on yeah, that one right now. You should. Uh, you can should. I take you through Charlie Morton's last handful of starts real quick? Yeah. Because I, I would lean Kyle Wright up until like four starts ago. And now Charlie Morton's back to being Charlie Morton, which is terrifying for everybody other than the Atlanta Braves. So this is what Charlie Morton has done. Six innings, four runs, 12 Ks. Then he goes seven innings, no runs, nine Ks, seven innings, two runs, 11 Ks, five innings, two runs, five Ks, seven innings, no runs, 10 Ks, and then seven innings, two runs, seven Ks. Charlie Morton's back. That works for me. Yeah. A lot of K's, not a lot of runs and a good amount of innings. His stuff is aging really well because somehow he hasn't lost a beat on his fastball. That's the thing that kind of throws me the most with him. He's still like in a mid nineties mode. And I don't know how he does that because we watch Wayno and the game slow down for him mentally. Like Charlie Morton, he's figuring out how to tap into this dad strength or this like 40 year old strength or closing in on 40 year old strength. I have no idea what's going on with Charlie Morton. All I know is, yeah, he's, he's turning this corner. And I feel like this is the type of guy that will get stronger after the all-star break. We're going to see it continue to roll. And then in September, we're saying Charlie Morton's really hot right now going into the postseason. And I mean, this dude broke his leg. Yeah, <laughs> Like, of course, he's going to get off to a slow start. He broke his leg. It's and weird. He threw, like get... six more pitches, right? Yes. You quite literally had had he had to get his legs back under him, like literally had. To. Yes. And now he's doing that. He's in business. Kyle Wright still looks like Kyle Wright. And if Ian Anderson can can get back to Ian Anderson form and then they get Soroka back, there's a laughable amount of pitching that this team has. And then we've talked about Michael Harris and everything they've got yes. going on over there. I still think the Braves are the team to beat in this division, yeah. especially with what Spencer Strider is starting to do now, which look, Strider all of a sudden NL rookie of the year case. Yes. Yes. Mackenzie Gore's fading really bad outing on Sunday. Spencer Strider is not only dominating, he's dominating with ease. I mean, guys are taking joke swings. Like you, you would, you would, he looks like a reliever right now. That's going six innings. Yeah. I, that's really what Strider is doing. And if he can keep that up, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see how he can keep that up because he does have a little bit of that challenge for the third pitch so far. It hasn't mattered. We've seen guys like Christian Javier show that it doesn't necessarily matter as long as you can sprinkle it in enough. The Braves are a problem, man. I mean, I think they could easily repeat three games set. You, you think Atlanta takes this? I, I, I really think Atlanta takes it. How telling is this going to be? Pre All Star break, I don't know. You tell me because, like, we it kind of goes into the point I was talking about, right? Like, we we our job is to react, but I also think our job is to react with within reason, right? Like, this is what's available. I think it's a good test and a good taste of what the postseason could look like, especially yeah. Scherzer versus Freed. I think it's a good opportunity to kind of see the differences up close. You know, especially tie game, late into a ball game, 
whose bullpen's holding up? You know, third game of the series, if you had two close games, you know, who's coming coming up clutch? And, you know, which team is, is really getting more quality starts? Which team has the bullpen that yeah. you feel like could shut it down? I, I think there's a lot of things that you can get a sense from in a three-game set ahead yeah. of the deadline. And it could be a little bit of that nudge. We know both teams are buyers. Could be a little bit of that nudge to say, wow, the Braves bullpen is better than we thought. Yeah. We probably got to go get another arm. You know, yeah. Drew Smith isn't going to cut it right now. Right. Uh, something like that. And and I, I'm very interested to see, you know, what, what 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 kind of takeaways we might get from this series. But Scherzer versus Freed is going to be like a great playoff appetizer, I think. Yes, 100%. And I, I think if either team wins it 2-1, I don't think that many, I don't think that either team should take away much from this series. If there is a sweep on either side, the team that gets swept shouldn't slam the panic button, but the team that does do the sweeping should feel good about oh, it. Yeah. They, they should know how they stack up here. Oh yeah. I mean, imagine like the Mets, you think about the narrative both ways. Mets go into Atlanta and, and they sweep, sweep them. They're the, the big Braves. bad Mets. With, yeah. with probably their three best bullets right now, I'd argue. I mean, Freed obviously is the ace. Uh, Strider's their hottest pitcher. And Morton is arguably his hottest Strider at this point. Yeah. I just read you through the stats. Uh, and, and, and you're going to Atlanta. The narrative there would be, uh, you know, this Mets team was in first. They hit a little bit of a lull. They underestimated the Marlins. And then they got the, the you know, the little kick in the butt. Yeah. And they're back. They're away. They are. Yeah. Braves, hot. Best team, arguably, in the National League comes into town and they knock them around, it's like, this is the Braves team we thought they could be. They've got yes. their guys healthy, and look out. So you can kind of come away with both of those. We'll probably end up getting a 2-1 split with little takeaways because that's how it is. But they also signed Robinson – or not signed, traded for Robinson Cano. Yep. Take off that SpongeBob jersey, Robinson. You're putting on a Braves jersey, man. Get ready to tomahawk chop, baby. Oh, baby. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, he'll be on the roster till Albies comes back. I think once Ozzy Albies comes back, he's done. I, I would assume so, unless he's raking. Unless he's uh, raking. I, he, he could be. You might but as look, well just give it a shot. I'm not, I think it's a fine, what was it, for like cash considerations? Yeah. Who yeah. gives a shit? Try it. And I know like some Braves fans are like, oh, I got to watch this guy <laughs> in, in, in a Braves uniform. Who cares? What he's doing in AAA right now is, I, I know it's AAA, and we're talking about a guy that statistically speaking should be in the Hall of Fame, but, you know, obvious reasons won't be. Yes. Uh, 333, 375, 479 slash line. In 104 plate appearances in AAA, three homers. Legitimate sample size. It's a legitimate sample size. It's AAA. If he was fully cooked, like fully, fully, fully cooked, he's not doing that in triple. Right. I really do believe that. Like, I, I, I do think that he should go there and he should hit in triple. But if he was as cooked as he looked, I mean, this is a dude that was hitting a buck 49 in his 24 games at the big league level. I don't think he's that cooked. No. I think with the same way we talked about Carlos Santana, as a bench bat Robinson Cano as a bench bat, I think is not the worst thing in the world. And this is a humbled Robinson Cano Robinson Cano with the Mets. You know, it wasn't that long ago. It was this year. This was not a guy that played in the minor league, got sent down to the minor leagues and had to wear a SpongeBob Jersey. This is a guy that was like pissed off, wanted to play more, wasn't playing and was mailing it in. I mean, you could just tell now he gets sent to triple. He probably was wondering if he was ever going to get a big league crack again. Now he gets it. I think this is going to be a little bit more of a, of a rejuvenated Robinson Cano. I'm not saying he's going to go out and be great, but I'm saying he's going to give you a little bit more effort and not be that nonchalant Cano that we got used to seeing in a Mets uniform. I know he's always been nonchalant, but he was extra yeah. nonchalant with the Mets. Right. He'll be a good bench bat. And if he's washed, then you move off in five games. Yeah. And whatever cash considerations amount it was, whatever it was worth consideration it. was, was worth it. It was worth it. I'm with you. All right. Pete and I will talk to you tomorrow. Uh, with more Just Baseball Show. Thanks, Scoopsy McGee. Thank you.